Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Hanser, and I am the Senior Partnership Manager here at the Green Sports Alliance. Apologies for the delay. We had a couple technical difficulties, but we're on now, and we're excited to have this conversation of leveraging the power of sports for impactful progress on environmental and social justice. So let me just um, go over a couple of pieces here before I pass it on to our panelists. All right, so you'll see in the sidebar of the chat box that there, uh, there is a place for you to submit any comments or questions throughout the session. You can do that any, at any time. We'll be monitoring that and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. I also just want to let people know that the recording of today's webinar will be available on our YouTube page here. And if you have any questions regarding how to access that, you can send us an email or any other questions regarding the, the webinar series. Our email address is listed right here. I also just want to let everyone know, in case you didn't see our announcement a couple of weeks ago, that we have finally announced that our 2020 summit is still happening. It will just be virtual this fall, October 13th and 14th. We've posted information on our website, which you can take a look at, and our registration will be opening in the next couple of weeks. There are still opportunities for sponsors, speakers, and partners, so you can send us an email at info at greensportsalliance.org to get any additional information, and we hope you're all able to join us. And then lastly, just a quick plug for our next webinar, which is happening at the end of the month, this is on the Ready to Play initiative that we launched in June about how to help the sports industry reopen in the face of COVID-19. So here is just an overview of that webinar. The invitation will be sent out to everyone joining us today, and that will be sent early next week. Without further ado, I will pass this off to Roger McClendon, who is the executive director here at the Green Sports Alliance. He'll be moderating the conversation and he will introduce our speakers. So Roger, over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the listeners who are joining for the session today. Um, you know, we'll try to take your questions or actually answer questions that we received earlier within the context of the conversation. If we don't get to answer your question, you know, we will try to respond to you uh, through email form. Uh, the current state, which we're all facing, I like to think about it as the three global pandemics. Uh, one obvious one is the COVID-19 that we're, we're battling. Uh, but two is institutional racism, which we've been struggling with for over 400 years. Uh, and the third is this silent killer, maybe not as silent uh, as we think, called climate change. Uh, we're going to be addressing two of the three today and throughout some of the webinar sessions. Obviously, we've been working on the COVID reentry, but the two of the three are what we're going to challenge ourselves with today. Now, through sports and leveraging the power of sports for impactful progress on environmental and social justice, uh, that is kind of the, ta the tagline of today's conversation. Um, but we know sports as a catalyst and a platform for change has been successful through leaderships of athletes, uh, through uh, persuasions of, of leaders to kind of, like John Wooden, kind of move the conversation along. Um, how can we leverage the power of sports to accelerate material progress on environmental and social justice issues as we support issues like Black Lives Matter uh, and the Sports for Climate Action Framework? How can we combat institutional racism along climate change? And, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Now, the objective is, is a pretty challenging one. You know, we have about uh, 45 minutes of conversation and we'll try to get to some of the Q&A. Um, and what we want to do is really kind of provide a context and understand language and, and create a platform of this discussion because a lot of times there's a lot of confusion. So if we could, you know, kind of create what that might look like, uh, that will give us the foundation to have conversations on, are we making progress? Are we working on the right things? Uh, how, and then at the same time, with these practical applications, is how do we continue to uh, leverage those best practices and share those across the whole sports platform? Um, the balance between this complexity and the grounding discussion and language on the framework is, is really one of the objectives today. Now, we have three distinguished guests that we're joining uh, on the panel today. and um, you know, with their expertise and experience with these topics, they'll kind of share uh, that experience and how we can look at the uh, intersection between sports and some of these issues. Um, I like to, you know, 
uh, introduce Kanal Merchant, who's co-founder and managing director of Lotus Advisory Group, uh, and is actually a board member of the Green Sports Alliance. And thank you for joining us, Kanal. Uh, Alonzo Jones is the Associate Athletic Director for Inclusion and Champions Life at Arizona State University. And, and recently I've, I've viewed his Ted Copa as a speaker on the Situational Identity Matrix. And pleasure to meet you, Alonzo, and have you here with us. And then Dr. John McClendon III, Professor of Philosophy at Michigan State University and co-author along with Stephen C. Ferguson of African American Philosophers in Philosophy, which is an introduction to history concepts and contemporary issues, which I think is very relevant today. Um, so two things I want people to think about, you know, and it's, it's a, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, keeping going in this insanity of a loop. <laughs> so adding a little humor to the conversation of a serious topic. Um, so Dr. John McClendon, I'm gonna give you the tough question to start us off is because with all this complexity and language, um, how do we look at a historical perspective of this, this issue of institutional racism and how do we look at sustainability, that intersection that presupposes that of human ecology and multidimensional concept of social sure. space and social change? Thank you. Uh, the importance of understanding institutionalized racism versus individual actions, which may, which may take overt discriminatory um, actions or intentional moves that one would make. For example, stating racial slurs would be an example of a personalized expression. But institutional racism is a matter of impact rather than intent. And so it becomes more complex to understand because the impact of policies and structures can have a bigger role to play when we think about racism than just individual actions where someone may use a racial slur or use uh, their positions uh, in communities to talk about people in a certain kind of fashion, like hate speech. So it becomes important for us to understand that racism is not just an attitude or belief that there exists superior or inferior races. More importantly, it is behavior and institutions that lend material support to those attitudes and beliefs by the actual suppression of the supposed inferior group. So when we begin to understand it in an institutional fashion, then we can talk about fundamental change. If we just talk about it in terms of individuals, you can replace the individual and put someone in the same institution and that institution will continue to function even though uh, the individuals in that institution have now changed. We understand then that institutionalized racism then is historic in the sense that it's intergenerational because institutions persist even though individuals die. And so that's why we see then a long legacy of over 400 years of institutionalized racism, beginning of course with slavery, uh, which was justified by way of the Constitution. Then after slavery with segregation, uh, which found its way uh, not first by law, but first by uh, terrorism, where the Black Reconstruction efforts were overturned by violence and people like Nathan Bedford Forrest, who played a key role in founding the Ku Klux Klan. And then later in 1896, it was formalized in the law with Plessy versus Ferguson. So we have to understand that the legacy of racism is sustained not just by individuals, but by institutions which transform themselves in historical context. Very good, very good. So now um, that's a good framework for us to kind of start thinking about it because we have it, you hear it on the news and people are talking about this institutional racism, but I don't hear the next level of conversation about, okay, what do you do about it? What, what do we need to change? So we'll come back to that point. I'm mm -hmm. gonna shift gears and jump uh, to Kanal uh, to talk about, you know, during our um, summit last year at Lincoln Financial Field, you know, we really expanded the platform. And you know, if you think about the Green Sports Alliance and a lot of folks on the phone 
you know, are focused on, you know, changing the, the stadium operations to make sure they're more sustainable and reducing water and energy around, you know, the climate impact. But we also know we have a, a responsibility to think about the centerpiece of that is the people, you know, the human side of that. And so as we expand beyond just talking about the environmental side, really engaging on the social side, you brought to the platform the conversation of environmental uh, justice. And I, I thought it was a great, so can you summarize a little bit of what we talked about there? And then with your new op-ed piece, which will go into more detail in the secondary questioning, you know, how, how we might make progress there. Why don't you share with the group uh, that move, what you're doing to lead that movement? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, Dr. McClendon has probably already given me five phrases that I wish I had been able to spiritually write down. You are very quotable, sir. Um, and that was, that was a wonderful way to start because it talks about how big this problem is. We think climate change is a big problem. Um, that we're all trying to find little places to, uh, to, to add impact. Same is true with the uh, you know, institutional racism we've had for now over 400 years. And so that's a huge issue. We gotta take a big problem, break it down into smaller pieces. And we look at the Green Sports Alliance and what we're about. And as we were approaching our 10 year anniversary, there were, there were some of us within the organization who said, are we really looking at this entire issue? Are we really having the entire conversation about what being green in sports means? Or are we guilty of the same kind of selective omission uh, that happens a lot on these issues um, that the Constitution reflects, for example? And so what we decided was we need to take a, uh, take a risk and talk about environmental justice uh, very explicitly at last year's summit in Philadelphia. And it was the first time we'd ever really tried something like that. We've typically hewed to a lot of the more technical venue discussions or athlete activism. And so we had this panel, it had Mustafa Santiago Ali, who's one of the leading voices in the country on environmental justice. We had Jerome Shabazz, who runs a wonderful environmental justice oriented uh, nonprofit in Philly. We had Connor Barwin, who's a former NFL player um, who had started a nonprofit that was really thinking about the spaces that young people in his community uh, live in and are they environmentally sound. Uh, and then we had a young man named Neva, Maya Vaughn, who is, I think, about 19 years old, who's cooler than the rest of us by far, and from Oakland, former athlete in high school, but his, his ambitions got cut short because he lived in a neighborhood with such bad air pollution, he got asthma, and so he pivoted from being an athlete to an artist, and he became a, a rapper, he became a hip-hop artist, and now he writes really thoughtful songs about environmental justice, and we got to see some of his work, um, and it was incredible. I think, you know, Roger, the feedback we got after the summit was incredibly positive on that session and it was probably one of the, the highlights of it and it was an experiment it was a test for us to say can we talk about this issue in the context of green sports and i think the answer was a resounding yes people are interested in this topic people get that there's a lot more to do uh, on this issue and it really was a wonderful way to start the conversation and so since then you know we've been trying to figure out what are the, those next steps and mind you, this is June and July of last year. So you talk about Groundhog Day, we get to a pandemic, which in some ways is exacerbated by climate change. And then you have all these tragedies with Joanna Taylor and George Floyd and all of that that then reintroduces the conversation. Um, but it's not the first time. And there's people, everybody on this call uh, and many others probably listening, you've been thinking about these issues for a long time. Um, we were thinking about it a year ago. And so the, the, the challenge and the opportunity is people are paying attention differently. Us doing this webinar today is gonna to have a different impact and resonance than if we had done it even six months ago because of everything that just happened. So that's important, more people are paying attention, but then how do we keep them paying attention and convert that attention to action? These are huge, complicated issues and good people over generations uh, have been trying to fix them and they're hard to fix, but you gotta hit them head on. Um, and you got to do your part of the moment. And so I'm happy to talk about more specifically what we're thinking. Um, but I'm excited that we have this moment um, to bring more people into the conversation and use sports as a platform to broaden the conversation about what environmentalism and climate change justice looks like, and then also how society as a whole thinks about these things. Thank you, thank you, Kanal. Great. We'll definitely come back and get more into the op-ed piece and what's next on that 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 part of the agenda. Yeah. Uh, Alonzo, uh, 
I'll turn to you and and you the we uh, 22 uh, letter that, that you guys composed and, and kind of your role uh, in championing athletes and having those them share in voices you know um, in in the in the time where you know you could be called out or you could be persecuted in a way so how do you manage being able to express your individual opinion and versus this shut up and dribble to be more than just one individual, be more than just a basketball player or a football player. Um, and so can you share your experience and what you're doing, the work you're doing at ASU? Yep, yep. Thank you so much, Roger. Truly appreciate the invitation from uh, Global Sport Alliance. There is a, uh, it's an important topic. I really like what Kunal said about uh, this being a different time to have both an environment and a racialized conversation. You know, uh, the tragic and untimely death of George Floyd sort of exploded the society and the young people are gathering. They're doing it in earnest ways. It's diverse. Uh, uh, it has no hierarchy uh, and it is uh, it is an intent on living beyond the news cycle. So it is very beautiful that we're having this conversation. The the institutionalized racial racial uh, racism that Dr. McClendon talked about. Uh, and I love the fact that he said it transcends death. Right. That means because grown folks teach their young folks the same ideology that they had, and it continues to perpetuate generationally, right? And so in order to have positive impact, it can't just be people and personalities. It has to be institutions who also combat perhaps their own institutionalized racism. And so I'm in a space under the leadership of Mr. Ray Anderson, uh, an African-American man with a long pedigree in sport, uh, and he is of the mindset that racism uh, is time for that to end. Uh, he uh, verbalizes that from his leadership capacity. He verbalizes that in his job kind of capacity. And he role models for us uh, the absence of fear to sort of step up in this particular moment and leverage both our professional opportunities to address racism uh, and to support students in their progress, but also to do that personally. And so the We 22 letter, that was written by a collective of 22 African-American men in Sun Devil Athletics. We wrote it from the perspective of people who have care for our 600 plus athletes, including the 100 plus that are African-American, but also from the perspective of sons and also from the perspective of fathers. We didn't push it through the institution. We pushed it through our own social media. But there is no denial. When we're working with beautiful young men and women coming of age, there is a blend between personal and professional. And so uh, we felt important to say something at that particular moment. And we put out seven points that, to hold ourselves accountable as to what we're gonna do in terms of helping our beautiful young folks come of age with a healthy sense of culture, a healthy sense of self, and a healthy sense of humanity. Uh, that just doesn't happen naturally. That has to be intentional. It has to be institutionalized, has to be programmed, and has to be purposeful. And so I'm just in a unique space where uh, we are granted permission. Uh, we're not looking over our shoulder and feeling like we're, we're going to be accountable or, or persecuted subtly and indirectly uh, for our ideology. And so it's a very unique space. I recognize that it doesn't exist everywhere. I'm just among the fortunate few where it does exist. And it needs to exist in more spaces. And that'll take courage of leadership. That's awesome. In fact, we're going to come back around to you as we go back through the loop. But I, I, I've read the the letter and I think it's powerful. Do you mind? You know, it's very it's not long. It's one of one pager. Do you mind reading that letter if you can get your hands on it? Because um, I, I think it would be great to share with the audience because those seven those points that you make are substantial. I mean, they're, they're important. Um, and so I think we can model that. You know, and, and I hope hopefully other universities can kind of take and m begin to model that leadership. So if you have it in front of you, feel free to, to read it. Or if you want me to circle back around while you look it up, um, or I could pull it off my phone. Um, I, I can find it. You want me to read it now? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I know you have a slam, a poetry slam up in here. <laughs> <laughs> you I, I think it's a powerful. That's a powerful statement. Uh, and and I think those seven points is we'll get into Kanal's work too. He's got some things, his recommendations on the climate pledge, you know, at NHL. And so I think we want to get into some of that detail as well. And then we'll come back around to, to Dr. McClendon to talk about, you know, from a policy perspective, you know, from conversations of defunding to police, which have been politicized, but really what is the true concepts of where those policy changes need to be made? How do we empower the community? To, to make sure they're holding folks accountable and have the power and the resources 
to actually be part of the solution. <laughs> and that and I think that's really a key concept. So if you if you do have that online, I can come back to you, Alonzo, if you're looking for it and we can jump into Kanal's points. Beautiful, yeah. If you can come back, that'd be great. Why don't we do that? Kanal, let's jump into uh the op-ed that you did with Mustafa Ali. I thought that was fantastic. And I know Bloomberg, I think, is looking to publish that, right? Yeah, yeah, no, we're excited. So Mustafa and I um we we kind of we, we we talk all the time about how we're going to put all this together right it's a puzzle how are we going to put the pieces of sports and environmental justice and, and advocacy together and amidst that conversation seattle's national hockey league team did something really interesting so for those of you who may not be familiar nhl is putting an expansion team in seattle um and they're refurbishing and renovating key arena which was the home of the Sonics for a lot of years it's basically building a brand new arena, but I think they're keeping the roof on top for like historical preservation reasons. And they came out with this, this press release announcing their naming rights deal. Um, and Amazon uh, is the key actor in that deal, but unlike the typical naming rights deal where it would be called Amazon Arena or Amazon Center, they decided instead that they were gonna name the facility Climate Pledge Arena, which is connected to a climate initiative that Amazon did. So that was interesting. That was a decision to say, hey, we want the naming rights deal, but we're going to focus it on climate instead of ourselves. Now, if ever there's a company that's probably cool without the additional marketing of an arena named after them, I think Amazon will be okay. I think we'll all still know what Amazon is, even if there's not a, a hockey arena based on them. But it was really interesting that they chose to do that. And it wasn't just the name. They had specific pledges underneath it. And so I got excited when I read it. Um, and I was crossing my fingers to say, are they going to do anything? around environmental justice or that kind of piece of it and you know it wasn't there they have great stuff about carbon neutrality and the materials and net zero emissions all that stuff really really good stuff uh, but nothing about environmental justice and that's not uncommon um that's that's most sports teams that's most sports leagues uh that's most conversations about green uh activities and sports and so mustafa and i have written this op-ed um that i think bloomberg is going to be coming out with uh probably next week uh, that basically says, great start, Amazon and NHL, um, but you got more to do, especially in a city like Seattle, which I think has the ninth highest rates, has the ninth highest worst air quality in the country, where there's specific neighborhoods within the city which have phenomenal environmental justice issues that have go back decades. That if you're going to be, if you're going to really want to be a corporate citizen on this issue of sustainability, you can't just do the technology, the solar panels and all that you got to be connected with the people in the community who are affected by the climate. Um, and so we talk about some specific things they can do. I think we need teams to start doing what I call a climate justice audit, which is the same way you do audits on all sorts of other things. Are you look at your team operations, look at your venue operations, look at your corporate partnership relationships, all of that. And if you think about it, if you're running a really energy efficient building, but the neighborhood around it is suffering because of the increased air, water, and soil pollution of all the activity you're generating, are you really being green? Or are you being green enough, right? So we need to think through that and add that to the conversation. The second thing is, you don't have to start from scratch. Um, there's organizations in every major city who care about these issues because there's populations who've had to organize themselves to deal with the fact that they have higher rates of asthma or lead or what else is going on. And so, and especially in a place like Seattle, which has such a great advocacy community, there's local organizations they could partner with, uh, they could fund, they could do authentic collaborations with to see where can we be helpful to you to further your agenda. So that's the second thing we talk about. The third thing is just plain straight up diversity, equity, and inclusion at the senior levels of your decision making. So it's a lot harder to see a problem if nobody at the table has ever experienced that problem or walked by that problem or drive by that problem or lived in that problem. And so there really needs to be an intentional effort um, at all levels to say, are we ha do we have all the right voices before we make decisions? Because I guarantee you, and I don't want to pick on NHL Seattle, like this is every team in the league, but you know, if more of those conversations are being had with people from uh, the affected communities legitimately involved, you're going to make a better decision because you're going to take in their feedback and you're going to adjust. And that's why I think um, that's a really important piece. It's, it's who you hire, it's who you partner with, it's who's in the room before the press release goes out. Um, the fourth thing we talked about is do an independent community advisory council, which means that 
long after the press release is done and you say you're going to do carbon neutral this or you're going to reduce emissions by that, who's really tracking it and who's grading your paper? And, you know, I used to be an executive for a basketball team. We made a bunch of promises on sustainability. Um, and we had a community advisory council whose job was to, like, check our math. And it made us better because we don't want this to be spin. The last thing we can do is get people's hopes up and then disappoint them by not following through. Uh, we got to build trust. And so I think that's a really important piece. And then the last thing, which I think is the most exciting thing, is sports is just fun and cool. It's, it's different than uh, a paper manufacturing plant, right? It's just interesting. Like the athletes are compelling. The coaches are compelling. The stories, all of that. And there's an am amazing ability for the athletes themselves and the people around them to tell, use all the platforms that we have in the modern era for sports uh, and to educate people on these issues. Can you imagine if today, if we had the kind of uh, infrastructure about environmental justice that we hope to build over the next few years, if that had existed right when Flint, Michigan happened, and you had the Pistons and the Lions and a bunch of athletes who had grown up in Michigan who could have all plugged into something around that issue to help the whole country care about the fact that in a major American city, a mom could turn on, on, on the faucet and try to give her kid a glass of water, and, and that would be uh, a terrible thing to do for the kid's health. Like if we could have told that story with the way that athletes can do, that would have been, a, we probably would be in a different place there. So these are very ambitious goals. They're not overnight fixes, but these are not overnight problems either. And so we lay those out in the op-ed. And then more importantly, we want to really stimulate conversations like this one and through the Green Sports Alliance to figure out how do we, how do we add this to the standard list of things that you're going to think about when you think about green and sports together. Yeah, that's excellent. No, well done and looking forward to that continued work. And so this is a great time to kind of talk about it. So thanks for sharing. So I'm going to bounce back to Alonzo. And, and Alonzo, I could read it, but it's really your, your team's and authorship. And I really think it's powerful coming from you and your positioning. So I, and, and I've read it several times and, you know, was very inspired inspired by it. So I think it would be well worth sharing it with the folks. And you know, they, they can go and Google it, hopefully, and, and find it <laughs> as, a, as a best practice. So go ahead, Alonzo. Well, Roger, thank you so much. And let me just sort of briefly give some context. This is the consensus uh, written outcome of the state of mind, kind of the spirit of uh, some of the African-American men within Sun Devil Athletics. And so, um, you know, it's kind of a mirror moment. You, know, you put something on paper, it's kind of like your word. So we wanted something to live up to and to live beyond the news cycle. So here it is. Uh, we 22. Dear America. We are black who have we are black men who have the responsibility of serving student athletes at Arizona State University, a power five conference institution, the largest in the country. We are also fathers, sons and husbands who are angered and frustrated with the repeated cycle of national disregard for black life. Our department is home to many young black lives who represent the university in their sport, but who are also developing their mind, spirit, identity and promise as coming of age leaders who will influence their future families in an uncertain America, we are concerned. With this as pre preamble, we 22 collectively share our thoughts in this moment. Since late August of 1619, or said differently, for 400 years or 146,000 days and counting, black lives have been enslaved, Jim Crowed, separate but equaled, red line, policed, discriminated, profiled and unlawfully killed in America, all while maintaining generational resiliency to keep moving on. This history of racism has negatively impacted our collective educational attainment, employment, property ownership, wealth accumulation, inheritance, health, liberty, and life. How do you quantify the emotional toll and rage heaped upon an individual, a community, a race of people for so long? It's impossible. But on May 25th, 2020, through the eight minute and 46 second strangulation of George Floyd, may he rest in peace, by Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, and the ensuing arrest, a possible new and lasting cultural understanding could begin if America will come to amends with its past and present racial hierarchy. We are 15 days into something different. We are witness to a time of collective and beautiful black self-declaration and action, earnest, young and diverse peaceful protests and loud and challenging voices from pro and collegiate athletes that are drowning out the aged and antiquated old way. In the midst of this pandemic, racial unrest and swelling black self-determination, we are doubling down on our responsibility to represent and serve our student athletes. 
families, and community. This is a pivotal moment in time in which we must put our knee on the neck of the mentality that applauds Black athletic performance, but, but does not see the full humanness of Black lives. In the example of our student athletes and in recognition of our position, this is what we will do for our student athletes, family, and community. We 22 will systematically develop young men and women who are champions in their education and lives, enhance fiscal education to create financial stable families with philanthropic mindsets, educate, register, and encourage voting in local and national elections, encourage participation in safe and productive free speech and social protests, encourage membership in campus and local organizations aligned with their causes, encourage ethnic study courses and informally reaching, researching the subject of race often, and lastly, and most importantly, model grown man behavior intentionally fighting to ensure the next four days, four months, and four and 40 years are vastly different than the past 400. This is what we 22 would do. Black Lives Matter America, the hierarchy must end. That part is on you. Signed by 22 black men within Sun Devil Athletics. Yeah, I think that's awesome to be applauded, you know, for sure, for sure. So thank you for doing that, Alonzo. I'm, I'm going to shift and keep this conversation going because it brings up some points. And we've had this all the way up to the highest levels of the current administration around all lives matter versus black lives matter. And I, I'd like Dr. McClendon to take a, a, a shot at that one so that people can understand, which in the context of why is that? And then this whole issue of power and institutional racism which Ben and Jerry's have called out, you know, at the highest level, which we'll get to next. So what, can you take sure. that one? Sure. The, the interesting thing is that for many people today who are embracing all lives matter as a counter argument to black lives matter, fail to see the logic of black lives matter. That is to say, black lives matter presupposes that all lives matter. So if you take a, a simple syllogism, all lives matter, all human lives matter. Black people are human beings. Therefore, black lives matter. Now, when you take that basic syllogism and understanding the reasoning behind it, then black lives matter presupposes all lives matter. So it is not an either or proposition, rather it's both and. If all lives matter, then black lives matter. So why do we have to raise the question about black lives matter? And here we get two different kind of propositions. The first is black lives matter as a prescriptive presupposition. That is to say, it ought to matter, right? So most people will agree that black lives ought to matter. So that is a prescriptive proposition. But then we have to weigh it against the reality. And the reality is that when black people are faced with police brutality and state terrorism, when they're faced with the conditions in terms of public health, the inability, for example, 5.4 million people just recently this week have lost uh, health insurance as a result of being unemployed based upon the pandemic. Some of you may know that, that three times as many people have died during this pandemic who are African Americans versus Euro Americans. So the question becomes then, the reality is that black lives do not matter. And that is the descriptive proposition. Now, the conflict between the prescriptive and the descriptive is what's key here. So when we say Black Lives Matter, that is what it ought to be. When we look at the facts that have been described so ably by both uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Merchant, we can see then that they don't in reality matter. So the question is why? And here we go back to racism. Here we have to go back to white supremacy to understand that. Because if they ought to matter, the question we have to raise is, why is it not the case? And so the demonstrations we see today are just one facet of this question of Black Lives Matter. The key question is, 
And I like the fact that Mr. Jones brought this point out. We call it an intergenerational relay race. That each generation has to pass on the baton. And when you pass on the baton of struggle, then you have to prepare each generation to take on the baton. And that becomes a question of education. So I was quite excited when I saw the We 22 statement that Roger shared with me because it was a powerful statement that educators, no matter what field of education they're in, should read. What you guys have said in that statement is a challenge to understand what it means to talk about, as they said many years ago, we called it education for liberation. And when we think in terms of education for liberation, then each one teach one. And we take on a responsibility so that each generation will be prepared to take on the task of social change, to continue to fight against environmental racism, to understand its institutional character. Now, let me say this, if I may, that when we talk about applying these principles to a practical solution, which is what is key here, we have to understand the nature of the problem. And let's look at how sports can be used as a leverage. A number of years ago, and still celebrated today, is when Jackie Robinson, as an individual, came back into Major League Baseball. And when I say came back into, that is to say African Americans were already in Major League Baseball and forced out. So Jackie Robinson wasn't the first African American in Major League Baseball. He was the first to enter back into it after a period in which African Americans have been forced out of Major League Baseball. But if we look at it very carefully, we notice that people celebrate 42. They celebrate Jackie Robinson, but they don't celebrate the Jackie Robinson who prior to going into baseball was faced with court martialing. He was court martialed because he refused to do what Ms. Rosa Parks did 10 years later is to give up his seat on a bus. Now, why is that important? Because social change can be characterized in a certain manner that distorts what is real social change. So today we celebrate the Branch Ricky, Jackie Robinson story as fundamental social change when it is not. Mm -hmm. What we should do is to go back and look carefully at Rue Foster. Now you may ask, who is Rue Foster? Well, Rue Foster started the Negro Baseball Leagues. He was the guy in 1921 that says, well, if they're not gonna let us in Major League Baseball, we'll fashion our own alternative. Now, what was his objective? His objective was not to just maintain a separate league. His objective was that when the time came that African-Americans would be integrated into Major League Baseball, they would not be integrated as individuals, as in the case of Jackie Robinson. They would be integrated in terms of teams. They would be integrated in terms of sporting uh, officials, umpires, managers, owners. And that becomes the basis of changing the power relationships that undercut white supremacy. Unfortunately, we, very few of us know that history. But if we can understand from that history, to go back to what Roger was saying about history and the loop, and not be caught in the loop of white supremacy, then we have to understand that future social change has to be at the level of institutional and systemic relationships. And let me make this clear. While many people say we need to close the gap of disparity we have to understand the closing the gap is to understand that the gap is only an effect of the cause. The reason why there's a gap between a slave and a slaveholder is not because the slaveholder has more things than the slave, it's the relationship that compels the slave to be exploited by the slave master. Mm -hmm. And the result is disparity. So it's not a matter of having more black slave masters that you transform the institution of slavery, you have to abolish the institution. So when we talk about defunding the police, and I think this is very important, 
that what we're talking about is the reallocation of resources, which is the power base of any institution. And if law and order is the subject of the day, we're by merely using police power to suppress people is a way of solving social issues, a, a way of dealing with racism and white supremacy, then we won't, we won't get anywhere. We will only reinforce the dominance in white supremacy. So the idea of defunding the police is a very important measure of fundamental social change because what this means in effect is reallocating resources so that when people who are mentally ill, when people who are on the streets, when people are, are sought to resolve problems that are beyond a police officer's capability, we bring the right kind of people to help with those problems. When people are forced to understand that their existence is criminalized, because that's what it means when the police comes, is quite different when we understand their condition as a medical condition or social condition or a family condition. And that's why we need to send out counselors, therapists, people who are trained to deal with those issues rather than criminalize the people who are already victims of white supremacy. So this is what defunding the police means. Giving those resources to the adequate institutions that can meet the needs of the people. Thank, thank you, that was really important because I know people are sideways with that. And I think we have this recorded so people can kind of yeah. go back and, 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 and listen and learn. So coming back to you, Kanal, you know, let's jump into uh, the details that you talked about with this, this op-ed piece. What can we do to bring in this environmental justice and expand it and where, where should we be headed with that? Yeah, so I think step one is just acknowledging uh, what everything that Dr. McClendon, what that amazing letter that Alonzo just said, says you gotta, you can't solve, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure, you can't solve what you don't talk about, and just putting it on the table is the most important thing. I mean, we haven't, there's not enough time to get into like all the land use decisions that have been made that, that are undergirding a lot of environmental racism today, but we've done a great job as a society in making it easy to not talk about this because you can live your whole life on this part of town and not have to deal with a lot of these concentrated impacts of systemic racism and specifically the institutional environmental racism. Um, we've done a really good job with that. And so we got to break that cycle by bringing the issue forward and having thoughtful people talking about it. Number two is we got to invite more people to the table. So even at the summit, I know Roger, you and I have talked about how do we change the complexion and composition of people who are participating uh, in the Green Sports Alliance. I guarantee you today, of the folks who are on the call, we got some new voices who maybe weren't there a year ago, two years ago, listening to our optimizing waste audit webinar, which is also very important, right? Mm -hmm. But we're broadening mm -hmm. our conversation. We got to get more people to the table because ultimately I'm an ally. I don't have the lived experience. I can be very uh, sincere in what I want to do, but it's but it's not it's not my issue. I don't feel it and live it, and I can I can be one of those people who can walk my daily life and not be there. So that is a weakness that needs to be solved, uh, understood and solved by bringing people to the table with a lived expertise that I just don't have. And that's not just true for me; that's true for everybody. So we need to, as a summit, as, as an alliance, we need to get more people to the table. And I want, I, we need to think about it in an asset-based way. Like, we haven't had time to talk about this. The power of this conversation is it's not just about removing a negative. There's so much positive and there's so much asset that everybody benefits from if we solve these issues. How much money do we waste on pollution mitigations and all of the, the criminal justice uh, distortion because we design it the wrong way? If we can, in our, in our sports world, be smarter about these issues on the front end, um, whether you run a venue or a team or work with athletes or community members, whatever, there's so many long-term benefits that we gain from. So this isn't just about righting a wrong, it's about, it's about seizing all of these benefits that we've never really gotten to get to because we're still stuck in this broken mindset. So bringing, you know, having the conversation, bringing people into the room and then listening and then figuring out all the different ways that sports can be 
helpful. And so for me, I don't have all the answers. I just want to convene the conversation and see what happens. That's what we started to do last year. The best, the best insights came from the audience. It came from all the side conversations that happened. there. I have a lot of faith in um, people. And when you have the millions of people that have been out in the streets over the last six weeks, which has never happened at that level in American history, and not just in the neighborhoods most affected by criminal justice. You had small towns uh, and rural areas where people came out risking their health. There's a moment here, people want to be helpful, people want to get involved and be solution oriented. We don't want to keep wearing these heavy clothes of institutional racism into the future. So the answers are there. And so it's about the will to bring people in the room and just listen, have uncomfortable conversations. And I think what will come out of that is a whole bunch of amazing stuff. I, I mean, we, I've told you a little bit about what we're thinking about, about the, you know, the business lens of doing the audits and having the partnerships and empowering your players. But I guarantee you there's 25 ideas that I'm not thinking of that would emerge from having real conversations with people. So I think this should be the first of several uh, on the topic that we as the Green Sports Alliance have. There's a lot of voices um, that need to be in the table. Um, and that I hope we can bring to this. And so this is just hopefully a spark and we can we can keep going from here. Yeah, I think you answered the question. It was one that came in and it was about the transformation. And I think you just kind of communicated how we start the transformation is getting the right stakeholders at the table, leveraging technology. And when you're smart, I mean, I, I take the Tesla as an example. I mean, you don't buy gas anymore. I mean, over you don't have any maintenance. I mean, they said, bring it back in two years and, you know, change uh change your windshield wiper fluid. I mean, so at, at some point when you are able to transform and look at a new way of doing things, that's the right right way. I mean, with that innovation and technology, you do get efficiency. And I think you have you make a lot of good points. We should reinvest into that and uh, that transformation. I think we need to lead, you know, and I think the sports industry, you know, the folks on the phone are asking questions like, what can we do to get engaged? It's to participate in these types of conversations. I'll bring up a couple other things before we shift the topic. So the WNBA, the Alliance Los Angeles 11, um, pro teams united to focus on social justice, to play an equity fund. Um, you know, the, the NFL football team changing their name up in Washington. Uh, they, we've had NBA uh, players make a video, NFL players make a video. I know MLB players are thinking about making a video to come out and position themselves. So you have this, this massive opportunity to communicate in a collective way that has the power, you know, to actually start to leverage what we're talking about change. Because it, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to want to come by itself. So we always know when you have something moving in one direction of mass, in order to move it to another direction, you need a force. Otherwise, it's going to keep going <laughs> in that same direction. So, so I think this is our opportunity and this is our leadership um, like time to kind of step up and, and move to the next level. So I, I, I'll, we've got about seven more minutes. We do have one question that came in and says, how do the speakers recommend going about illustrating or highlighting to those that say there is no issue that the three that the three pandemics are in fact problems that not, need to be resolved. Um, so I guess that's the climate deniers that are saying, you know, we really don't have a climate issue, or you know, we really don't have this institutional racism issue. Maybe if I'm misreading the question, but I think um, the evidence is 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 definitely there. I don't think I don't see how you could deny in, in any of those three from COVID to what we're seeing in the hospitals to, to everything. But Alonzo, I'll let you take that, and then we we'll go around the horn. Well, I just want to contextualize with Kanal, the fact that we have been social distancing for, for about five months now, have not been out in the broader society, are we not seeing positive impacts upon the environment, which would indicate human interaction is impacting the environment? <laughs> yeah. One Amen. great example. The, the skies are a lot clearer in Mumbai right now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah. So um, we've got about five minutes left, and there's just a, a, a couple of things that I kind of want to highlight. First, I want to thank you, uh, distinguished guests and speakers, for providing that insight. And it was really tight onto some of the components. Obviously, we could have this go on for another couple of hours. It could be a week-long seminar. And you know, I may have mentioned this. Our plan is to have a series. 
So this was this really the first step to kind of plant the foundation. Uh, and obviously there's uh, real support to expand the conversation beyond the typical environmental discussion into the social discussion. And so we'll continue to do that. Um, we'll leverage some of the topics and questions that we didn't get to and merge that into the next webinar series or I'll address those. But I think this will be going part of our responsibility. And I, I think, Kanal, you started it with that first conversation as we had talked about what do we need to plan for this. And I think it needs to be, you know, as we look at the SDGs and the broader framework of the sustainable development goals from the UN that include these issues around social justice. Um, you know, we need to expand that into the our platform at the Green Sports Alliance, and that's that's what we're doing. The other thing I like to share is you talked about accountability, and I think we all heard that here. And a metric, a measurement system, because what you don't measure, you don't make progress on, and if you you know you, you don't can't hold people accountable to the progress that you need to make. So I think through technology, and as we're thinking about the whole climate, you know, co even COVID, and even racial justice is putting in the right metrics and the right systems to hold people accountable. And I think it's a positive thing, Kanal, like you said. I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. We'll be a better society. We'd be more productive. But we're leveraging all the, the talent of the individuals that make up um, this, what we call the United States of America. You know, the people like Steve Jobs were immigrants and others that came into the country to immigrants that have, you know, contributed successfully to the society. We'll have a much stronger uh, United States of America. So I think there's a lot of work to do. I appreciate everybody's time. I, I, I really appreciate everybody's continued um, commitment to the struggle. So any any last words? And we got like two minutes. Any last things? We, we'll go around the horn. Alonzo. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just in closing, a lot of people say, what can we do, right? What can you do? Well, there's literal things you can do. There's donations, there's time resources that you can put. But I think the work really has to be in your mind, right? The work is in the mind. So if you look at Black Lives Matter, it has it's both a question and a declaration. If you say Black Lives Matter with a question mark, you're talking to the broader society about their perception of blackness, right? If you put a, a, an exclamation point on it, then it is the, 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 the cry out, the decree, the pronouncement that I exist and I'm gonna have legitimacy and human equality and life and value, right? So it is this nuanced thing, but how you perceive the question is tied to your mind. If you look at sports, sports is, subje uh, is a objective. Two people line up in the same space, the clock goes, who finishes, uh, who, who crosses the line first is, is, is indisputable, right? That is objective. That is, that is not of the mind, that is of the eyes. Things that are of the mind, education, uh, English paper, uh, an interpretation of a, of a crime scene, of approaching someone, how you respond to that. It's not an eye test, it's a mind test, right? So now we're in the society where how can we work on our minds to think about how we perceive and believe the value of other human beings? Sport is an example where when people compete based upon understanding of rules, understanding of preparation, training, all that, you have outcomes that are of the, of the eye. The society right now needs to sort of grapple with its own mind, right? You don't have 400 years of racial hierarchy uh, uh, without that being an outcome of how someone exists, how they perceive the world. And they, and they go into institutions, justice, corporate, journalism, whatever the case may be, and they, they, things come out of their mouth, but it is shaped by biases that are in their minds. So if we can take time to work on our minds, both our cultural sense of self and esteem, but also how you were taught to think in racial hierarchical lines. And, and the nation is saying, that's enough of that. That's enough of this racial hierarchy and this thing has to change. Appreciate it. Kanal, any last words on your side? Yeah, and I will drop right at 11. I'll just say this. There's probably a lot of people on the, on the call who wanna be allies and have already been allies. Let's hold ourselves accountable to being uh, allies against symbolic racism and systemic racism. Let's not get so caught up on the symbol that we don't think about the system. It's great that there's painting of Black Lives Ladders in the street or taking down statues or the team names or the chance of changing. It's all important. It's about the narrative and the culture. But don't let's not make that the end of what we think this conversation. These systems are hard and boring and tedious to fix. 
And that's where the real work, that's the intergenerational work that Dr. McClendon is talking about. So let's just make sure we do both. I'll, I'll end on a quote, one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite authors. It goes like this, the quotation about character. It goes, as we come to take this sojourn across the sea of life, whether we hold steadfast the storm or whether we go slowly sinking to the bottom of the sea depends upon a dedicated captain and a determined crew. For the course that we travel should not only be determined by the turbulence of the sea, but more importantly, by the quality of the ship. Dr. John McClendon III. So I appreciate that quote. Thank you all. Uh, appreciate everybody. This Got is up. only the beginning of the conversation. So thanks all. I'll let everybody sign off. Take care.